In all the hurry and hustle and confusion of modern living, the Lord has a way. We believe the Bible is a revelation of his way. We invite you to join us for In Search of the Lord's Way with Mac Lyon. Greetings to you, my friend, and welcome to our program of Bible study In Search of the Lord's Way. We rejoice and are glad that you invited us into your home again today for Bible study, the search of the Word of God. The Scripture says that the people in the New Testament city of Berea were more noble than those in Thessalonica, because when Paul preached to them, they searched the Scriptures daily to see whether those things which he preached were so. So true nobility consists not so much in crowns and thrones and ancestry, but in a sincere desire to learn and to know the truth which God has treasured up for us in His Word. Thanks for joining us. There's a passage in the Old Testament book of Proverbs that speaks of some hateful things or some things that God hates. We like to think of God as a God of love, not hate, and that's good. But when God loves something, it has to follow that He hates its opposite. So there are some things that God hates. It would be good to know what those things are, wouldn't you say? Such knowledge just might mean that we would not fall into that practice. We're calling today's message the Seven Things God Hates. If you'd like a free printed copy or an audio cassette tape of the message, you may have it by writing us in search of the Lord's Way, Post Office Box 371, Edmond, Oklahoma, 73083, or by email, searchtv at aol.com. Our toll-free telephone number is 1-800-321-8633. For your use and for making requests, use that telephone number or uh, use any of the address. Everything's free to you, paid for by your friends in Churches of Christ. Ken Heltbrand is leading us now. And some of you have asked, uh, is our music by a trained choir or a chorus? And the answer is no. It is the congregational singing of the Edmond, Oklahoma Church of Christ, led by Ken Heltbrand. These Christians love to sing and praise God with psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, the fruit of their lips, as the Bible says. We're reading Proverbs chapter 6, verses 16 through 19. There are six things which the Lord hates, yes, seven which are an abomination to Him, haughty eyes, a lying tongue, and hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked plans, feet that run rapidly to evil, a false witness who utters lies, and one who spreads strife among brothers. And now with that in mind, let us go to God in prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, holy and reverend is your lovely name. And we bow before you with humble hearts to express gratitude to you for your presence with us in our lives, for the blessings you grant us along the way, but especially the blessings we have in Jesus our Savior, the blessing of salvation, the best way to live that man has ever known, and then the hope for life beyond the grave when life is finished here for us. We pray in His name that we may be edified by the message today. Amen.
The scripture we're studying today, Proverbs 6, verses 16 through 19, is a powerful expression of the mind of God about some things that are all too common to our human behavior. It's an Old Testament scripture, and someone may be saying, I've always heard you folks don't believe in the Old Testament. Sorry about that, you've heard wrong. The Bible is the Word of God, all of it, both Old Testament and New Testament, and we believe and preach all of it. In Romans 15, verse 4, the Holy Spirit says that whatever was written in earlier times, that would be the Old Testament period, was written for our instruction that through perseverance and the encouragement of those scriptures, we might have hope. It's true, Jesus Christ fulfilled the Old Testament prophecies and blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, he took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. Colossians 2.14, that's King James Version. But we still learn and are encouraged by God's Word in the Old Testament. Solomon was inspired of the Holy Spirit to write the Proverbs centuries before Christ was born in Bethlehem's manger. And God's attitude toward the things mentioned in this passage has not changed. Social conditions may change. Moral codes may change. Man's attitude toward these hateful things may change. But God's does not. This passage is as relevant as if it were the last verse of the Bible. A, posit a good positive and uh, mental attitude is essentially a part of Christ's religion. The Christian is taught to think on the things that are true, that are honest and just and pure and lovely, and the things that are of good report, Philippians 4 and 8, and be thankful for them. But he is also informed of the evil, negative forces, so that he may avoid them and not fall victim to them. There comes a time when the most positive person in the world needs to face the reality of some of the darker things, maybe negative things. If that growth behind my ear or on my back is cancerous, oh, it would be good for me to know it so as to give it due attention. If the habit I'm forming is addictive and damning, it'd be good for me to know about it and face up to the dark reality of it. And if someone would point that out to me, he'd be a blessing to me for sure. So this passage says that there are six things which God hates. Then a the seventh is added, sort of an afterthought, but really to suit the Eastern poetic form or style. Seven is not to be taken as a definite number so as to exclude all other transgressions or evils. No one should feel flattered because his besetting sin, as we sometimes call them, is not mentioned among these things. All transgression of God's law is sin, 1 John 3 and 4, and God hates all of it because God hates sin should be reason enough for any of us to condemn sin in the strongest ways possible, not only because he will surely and certainly punish all sin, but because it separates us from God and destroys a lovely relationship with him as the father of our spirits. The passage says, these six, six things doth the Lord hate, yea, seven are an abomination unto him. That's strong language. Let's see what they are so we may avoid them. What do you say about that? Number one, a proud look. This is King James, a proud look. God hates a proud look. As I read a while ago, the New American Standard Version says, haughty eyes. Say, that gets personal, doesn't it? Gets pretty close to some of us. Even those of us who are proud of our humility. It's hard to live in a world that puts a premium on pride and not develop a proud look. When we're taught from infancy almost to be number one, and we are striving to be number one, it's hard not to act like number one, or we think we're number one. In fact, we're told that the first step in becoming number one is to act like number one. What are we talking about? We're talking about the spirit or the attitude that springs from an awareness of physical or intellectual or social or spiritual superiority. 
the consciousness of superior strength or beauty or learning or eloquence or prominence of rank or achievement, maybe it is, that shows itself in a disdainful tone of voice or a cutting remark or some exclusive behavior. God hates that sort of thing. Perhaps he hates it because he sees something there that we don't always see. It's essentially a false thing. It's self-praise, which is not really due. Therefore, it's false. It projects a false image of a person, and it's very unbecoming of him. Anytime any person who raises his eyebrow at another because of his color or education or wealth or position, well, for any reason, is unbecoming and is unlovely. It doesn't, he doesn't wear it well. A proud look is also a cruel thing, cruel and thoughtless and inconsiderate. It wounds, and it wounds deeply, and it wounds the most sensitive souls the worst. When Jesus was asked, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven, you remember what he did? He called a little child and set him in the midst of the disciples, and he said, Whosoever shall humble himself as this little child, the same is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Yes, the Lord resists the proud, and he gives grace to the humble, James 4 and 6. Number two, God also hates a lying tongue. Proverbs 12, 22 says, Lying lips are an abomination to the Lord, but they that deal truly are his delight. Abomination means disgusting. Perhaps one of the reasons why a lying tongue is so despicable in the sight of the Lord is that he knows that out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaketh, Matthew 12, 34. A lying tongue betrays a deceitful heart. You know, we all misunderstand the words and actions of other people at times. Misunderstanding is bad enough though it might be excused as misunderstanding, but to fabricate a story. I mean, just plainly and simply sit down and conceive an outright lie for whatever pretended high and noble purpose and go out and tell it against someone for personal gain or glory or advantage over him? That's the most shocking and shameful behavior known to men. God hates that sort of thing not only because it destroys the good name and the usefulness of the one against whom the lie is told, but because it's also ruinous to the soul of him who does it. A person who falls into that kind of habit is self-destructing. God has said, All liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death, Revelation 21 and 8. A proud heart, a lying tongue, and hands that shed innocent blood. As we said a while ago, sin is defined in the Scriptures as transgression of the law, 1 John 3 and 4. It's called disobedience, missing the mark, and rebellion. All such behavior is offensive to God, but the greatest single affront to God is the sin of murder. Our first thoughts take us back to the very first pages of the Bible. Genesis chapter 4 to the story of Cain and Abel. Cain, in a fit of jealousy, killed his brother, at which time God pronounced the, death, the penalty of death on the murderer. Genesis 9 verse 6, he said, Whoso sheddeth man's blood by man shall his blood be shed, for in the image of God made he man. This passage in Proverbs is often used to show the terrible sinfulness of abortion. The taking of the lives of more than one and a half million little innocent, helpless, preborn, or partially born babies in America every year is a terrible thing. And certainly that's what abortion is all about. In the light of the Scriptures, abortion is indefensible. No way of defending it by the Bible. A mother's freedom of choice over her own body is not the question. It's her freedom to shed innocent blood, even if it's the blood or the life of her own child. Legalized abortion is our national shame for which 
we must be brought to our knees in repentance. We can never hope to convert our society of violence and fear into one of peace and tranquility until we have reversed Roe v. Wade. Then the next verse says, verse 18, God hates a heart that devises wicked imaginations, and this too is an abomination to God. These are the people who use their inventiveness and skills, not to the good of others, not even for the good of their own families, but as the robber on the road to Jericho in Luke 10, they use their ingenuity to bring other people to distress and ruin. Whatever may be their motive, base gain, mere profit, to wield their power or just because they're big enough to do it or in a position to do it, they prey upon and seek the destruction of anyone who crosses their wicked ways. The child molesters, the pornographers, the muggers, the rapists, those who for profit or pleasure misuse and abuse abuse other people fall into this condemnation. Number five, closely akin to them are the feet that, sweat, that uh, be swift in running to mischief. The devil, or the evil heart, devises wicked imaginations, and the feet are swift to carry out that wickedness. These are the people who consort together to do evil. They tell lies, they plan mischief, and they do evil with no regard for the innocent. Do you remember the school bully? <laughs> Every school I ever attended had one, and I assume all the others did and still do. In my day, he used his fists, and his victims would have to get up off the ground and dust themselves off and maybe wipe a little bit of blood off their cheeks or something. But nowadays, he may be carrying a gun or some other dangerous weapon to school, and his victim may wake up in the emergency room of a hospital somewhere. Well, that school bu bully grew up and graduated from the university and found a position in business and social circles and often in the church. But he's still what he was then, the bully. He may or may not use a gun or knife, or he may use the printing press to throw himself around. God hates that kind of behavior. It's the very opposite of what he would have us to be. Number six, verse 19 adds, a false witness that speaks lies. It's generally understood that the Holy Spirit is speaking here of the act of perjury, giving false testimony in a court of law. There's no doubt that perjury is included here, but perhaps there's still another more common way a person can uh, give false witness against another. What about propagating a lie about someone because we have no proof of the story's validity? We hear something that's totally untrue, and we bear witness to it by telling it to other people with no thought at all of learning first whether it's true. We didn't create the lie. We didn't personally fabricate the lie, but we gave credence to it by repeating it as though it were the truth, and we knew it was the truth. God hates that sort of thing, and that person will find himself in the same place as the liar, the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. The last of these seven things that God hates is the practice of sowing discord among brethren. The New American Standard Version says, one who spreads strife among brothers. Blessed are the peacemakers, said our Lord. Cursed are the mischief makers, says our text. Another in Proverbs, another proverb is in chapter 16, verse 28, and it says, A perverse man soweth strife, and a whisperer separateth chief friends. Another says, Make no friendship with a man that is given to anger. And with a wrathful man thou shalt not go, lest thou learn his ways and get a snare to thy soul. Proverbs 22, 24, and 25. Sowing discord among people is bad, bad, bad business. In social and business circles, it's even worse in the home, but it's even at its very worst in the church. The Bible declares such discord and division among those who call themselves Christians is a work of the flesh and will keep a person out of heaven. Galatians 5, 19 through 21. Let us pray. Thank you, God, for teaching us how to live, for helping us to avoid the pitfalls of these evils that you despise and hate so badly. Bless our study to each of our lives, we pray in the name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen.
Now let us remember the things that God hates, yea, the things that are an abomination in His eyes, a proud look, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked imaginations, feet that are swift to running to e uh, mischief or evil, a false witness that speaks lies, and the person who sows discord among brethren. He hates them because whatever the pretense or the disguise under which they're practiced, however noble their professed intentions, they're the works of the devil. The practice of them will cause people to be lost in hell, and they destroy a person's beautiful and loving spirit and relationship with the Heavenly Father. There's a better way. It's the way of Christ that focuses man's attention and attractions on things higher and more noble, and it offers man relief from the guilt of all such abominable behavior. Christ found people during His personal ministry whose lives were characterized with such evils as we've discussed today. He invited them to come and follow Him, and He would give them rest and peace from all such things as that, Matthew 11, verse 28. Well, that invitation is still open, and it's open to you today. It's the purpose of this program to encourage you to confess Jesus Christ, repent of your sinful lifestyle, be baptized in His name for the forgiveness of your sins, according to Acts 2.38. And I hope you'll do it promptly. I hope you feel your time has been well spent by being with us today. If you've been seeing our program before, you've noticed some things are different about it, one of which is that we don't spend our time pleading with you to send us money. This program is supported by Churches of Christ in the area of this television station because we love you and uh, we care about your needs. You've probably noticed, too, that we not only talk about being Bible believers, but that we really do use the Bible as our guide in faith and morals. We want a book, chapter, and verse for what we do and what we teach. We love the Lord Jesus Christ and believe that He died for our sins. And through Him, we have the hope of eternal life with God. Now, if you're of the same disposition, and I think you are, then I think you'd enjoy worshiping with us at the Church of Christ here in your own community. Why don't you begin right now to do that? Get ready and be in the very next worship service that's announced. And if you don't know when that is, or if you don't know where it is, why, you let us know, and we'd be happy to help you find that place. If you'd like someone to come to your home and study the Bible with you before you go to the assembly, let us know and we'll get in touch with that person right away. It'll be someone from right here in your own community, perhaps someone you already know and appreciate. Let us hear from you. Will you do that? If an audio cassette tape or a printed transcript of today's program would be useful to you, you may have one free for the asking. Just write us in search of the Lord's Way, Post Office Box 371, Edmond, Oklahoma 73083, or by email, searchtv at aol.com. You may use our uh, toll-free telephone number and call us. That number is 1-800-321-8633. Ask for the program by the name, The Seven Things That God Hates. In the meantime, be thinking about this from the Scriptures. It's found in the book of Proverbs, chapter 1, verse 7. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. God bless you this week. We love you.